Shalom brothers and sisters. How are you tonight? Hope you're doing well. I have a, um, I think some pretty cool connections to make tonight, but I want to share some things with you that I think the Lord is trying to communicate to his people right now because they're getting a little bit weary and tired right now. Um, so I'll give it a second, but I just want people to, to hear scripture so they can consider what it means and then apply it. Because if we're not going to listen to what God says, then how are we going to do what he says? And then how are we going to be blessed? It's just that simple. Um, I'm not saying it's easy to do it. I'm saying it's that simple. So um, being holy, right? Saints, what is a saint? Um, if you define saint according to scripture, it's called a kadoshim in Hebrew, which is a, it, it's a form of the word kadosh, which is holy and um, meaning set apart. So you're supposed to be a set apart people. Um, so while I was reading in the, the epistle of Jude, that's where I'm going to start. Pretty amazing stuff when you start seeing how, you know, Jude, you can go so deep in these things. Now, I'm not trying to make you get super deep. I'm saying if, if you start to connect the dots, it's like scripture becomes alive. Hey, brother. Um, so the book of Jude, or Yehuda, Jude, however you want to say it, because everyone's using different versions. It says that he was a slave of the Messiah, Yeshua, a brother of James or Jacob. So Yeshua, Jesus had two brothers, at least two that we've recorded here that wrote epistles. It says to those who are called, who are loved in God, the father and kept safe for Yeshua, the Messiah, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied in you. I mean, what a great greeting, right? Don't we wish that for everybody? But it says in verse three, loved ones, though, though very eager to write about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you, urging you to contend or continue to contend for the faith that once was for all handed down to the saints, the Kedoshim, the saints, set apart ones. It says, so for people, certain people have secretly slipped in. Those who from long ago have been marked out for this judgment, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into indecency and deny the only master and Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. So there's going to be people and they've been doing it since this time, which took a couple thousand years ago. They've been um, beguiling people into something that has twisted the word uh, grace to mean something that is not. He's saying they're going to do this. They're going to pervert God's grace. They're going to twist it into something that is not what God calls his grace. Okay, so there's one thing. I just want you to hear this. Contend for the faith. Okay, contend. It's time to like not get weary and sidelined by politics and all these other things that are going on. Though that, that stuff is the massive deception. People are are absolutely bent on politics and they think politically. They don't think biblically because if you thought biblically, you wouldn't be um, posting some of the stuff you post about the government and and what they're doing because that the, the government is only assigned to punish the people that have um, twisted God's word. And if we've fallen into this camp, these these people, then we're involved with them. So that's a, a warning. That's why Jude wrote the, the epistle to warn you. So you can read the rest of the epistle. But what stood out to me when I was also reading in First Peter, and First Peter, the epistle of First Peter and Jude have a ton in common, but this is what it says in First Peter. I'll start in verse chapter one, verse 13. It says, so brace your minds for action very similar to the content for the faith statement that Jude makes. Keep your balance. What's the balance, guys? Grace and truth, right? Grace. What is grace? It is the, the, the favor of God, okay? Yes, but it's deeper than that because if it's just the favor of God and there's no requirement to obey God, then it's just cheap grace, which is exactly what um, Brother Judah is saying in his letter. Cheap grace. Like twisted and perverted grace. So the balance is grace and truth. Grace is, yes, the unmerited favor of God. God's pouring it out on people, but people will reject the grace of God because they don't receive it. And what is happens when you receive it into your heart, the deepest part of your yourself, is it's the influence on your soul to follow in God's righteous decrees, his instructions, his laws, his Torah, his, his instructions, his teachings. That's what it means. It's not a bad word. Law is not a bad word. Maybe it's a bad translation, but it's not a bad word. So God puts us in our hearts. And the spirit of grace is the conviction that we're, that we're sinning, which means we're disobeying the truth. 
So then there's the other side of this, right? The balance, truth. There's people who are like, the Torah is truth, the Torah is truth. And I'm sure I've said it many times because it's what the Bible says all over, right? Psalm 119, his law is truth, his Torah is truth. So we have to stay balanced in the fullness of grace and truth. Who does it perfectly? Messiah Yeshua does it perfectly. Do we do it perfectly? I mean, this is why you have to have a sober estimate of yourself and contend for the faith by having a balanced understanding of what grace and truth are because if you just go the grace route, you neglect the truth. If you just go the truth route, then you're in legalism and you've rejected the, the favor and grace of God because it's not that he's excusing your sin, not at all, but we, we sort of get prideful in our, ob our obedience when you get into Torah movements and things like that, you start thinking you're, you're impressing God God, God's not as impressed with your your obedience to the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, the spirit of the law that is in your inmost being. Okay, and I'm going to touch on this and what it means. But let's continue. First Peter thirteen says, "So brace your minds for action. Right, faith is action. Keep your balance and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. So the fullness of of grace is going to come when He returns." Um, we get a measure of it right now. Each each vessel, we're the vessels, right? We get a measure of the grace of God. Here's what he says in verse 14. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Ignorance. So once you know something's true, and then you don't follow it, you don't obey it, now you're, you're willfully ignorant. So God is extending his mercy, which is he's withholding the, the punishment that is due to you because you've made the profession right you've received the revelation you have this this excitement of the hope that's in you for the messiah to return but there's a massive warning here not to go back into those things not to do those things again because then you're rejecting the grace of god because if you're just saying a prayer and you're saved and i talked to a man last night for hours he thinks everybody's going to be saved and i said how could that be not everybody's god's children only those who've been born again, you have to be born again or get the new heart and the spirit. I said, you know, you think a, 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 a rapist, a child rapist is going to enter into the kingdom of God? No, just because he said a prayer. Now, is it, can there be genuine repentance for somebody who's murdered people or done that? There has to be. I mean, there's examples biblically of this, the thief on the cross, right? We see it. He admitted his guilt. This is why God gives grace to the humble. The people can humble themselves. So we don't know of somebody, but that's why we have to stay in, in forgiveness. Because if we have to, um, if we are angry with people, especially our brothers and sisters, right? I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do a message soon, I don't know, God willing, about how there's contrast in the Bible. It says one thing somewhere else, it says the opposite somewhere else, and they're both true. So we can't just go one way all the time. We have to realize that maybe it's a time to reap. Maybe there's a time to sow. Right there's there's a there's a time to water. So there's a time to you know all the things that are in Ecclesiastes three are in there for a reason. Okay, now in your ignorance, right? Instead, now verse fifteen, First uh, Peter three, First Peter one fifteen. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do, for it is written. Yeshua says, it is written. Well, Peter says, it is written. It says, be holy, be set apart, for I am holy. Kadosh. Be kadoshim, saints, for I am holy. Now, that's a reference in Leviticus. Now, a lot of the people in Messianic circles go to Leviticus 11 and say, see, you're not supposed to eat ham. Um, I don't think that's the reference here. Why I'm going to tell you that? Because if you go to Leviticus chapter 19... Huge chapter, okay? Massive chapter. Some people only use two verses out of it. I don't think that's right. I think you have, or one half of a verse. I think you should look at it all. I'm going to touch on several of them. I think you should read the whole thing. Maybe you'll get more out of it than me. But if Peter is saying to the people who trusted in the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, a.k.a. Jesus the Christ, he's saying, be holy. What does it mean to be a, a saint? Leviticus 19. Here's what it says. The Lord, Adonai, spoke to Moses, saying, now this is directly out of the mouth of God, speak to all the congregations of the house of Israel, the children of Israel, and tell them, you shall be holy, for I 
I'm God, I'm God, you're God, I'm holy. Boom, there's the connection. So Peter's making reference to Leviticus 19, for sure. He says, now verse three, people stop and go, be holy for I'm holy. It says this, each one of you is to respect your mother and your father. What's that? Oh, that's from Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20, right? Obey your parents as in the Lord. So it's a promise. Like it's a, it's a command and a promise, right? So he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Number two, keep my Sabbaths. Fourth commandment. How will you be holy? So far, he's saying, honor your mother and father, keep my Sabbath. And then he adds this, I am the Lord your God. Verse four, do not turn to idols. First commandment. What's the first commandment? I am the Lord, right? I am the Lord who, who rescued you from the bondage of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. So don't, you can't have idols or make a golden and make molten gods for yourselves. What is that? Graven images, second commandment. For I am the Lord your God. He's, he's not saying these are suggestions for you to you know, attempt to be holy. He's saying these are commandments. So, so far we got, don't only obey God. Don't make any images, no idols. We have keep the Sabbath and we have obey your mom and dad. Okay, let's scroll down. There's, there's some information out there about sacrifices and um, what they're supposed to take care of the poor. But it says in verse 11, right? Oh, sorry. I don't. I don't. I, I don't have Wi-Fi in my hotel. Sorry. Um, he says you are you are not to steal. What is that? I think that's the eighth commandment, right? You are not to lie. Do not deceive one another. Don't bear false witness. Ninth commandment, right? And then you have you are not to swear falsely by my name. The third commandment. And so profane the, the and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So he's going over the Ten Commandments. What does it mean to be a set apart people? The milk of the gospel. You know, trust in the in the Son who reconciles you to God because of the sacrifice, and now be set apart. Obedience to the Torah. Okay. The messianic circles I was making um, a reference to is that when Peter says, "Be holy, for I am holy," most people I don't know. I used to do it too guilty i'd go oh look it says leviticus 11 be holy for i'm holy um leviticus 11 44 it's all about not eating unclean food um i i firmly believe that he's talking about leviticus 19 and first peter 3 he's not talking about eating um clean and unclean now are you supposed to eat unclean no those laws didn't change i have a video about that I, I, we talk about it so much that we make food the stumbling block for a brother to come to faith don't, don't worry about what other people are eating and drinking because the, the kingdom is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And most people, I'm not saying most, a lot of people in the Messianic circles have no joy because they're not actually obeying the spirit of the law. They're going back to the letter. That's the point I was making. Um, so Leviticus 19, you know, back to where it says, you are not to oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant are not to remain with you all night until the morning. I mean, I took that seriously. I, I have employees and I pay them right away. I don't wait a week. I don't wait a day. Usually I don't wait an hour. I make sure they're paid because, you know, the Torah really, yeah, no problem. The the, um, the Torah really is um, a light, right? It's something that's in us that Yeshua, you know, represents the light of the world, but it's in us to... Um, do unto others as you'd have done unto you. That's the the, the whole goal of Torah is um, is met there in Matthew seven. You'll read that. Um, spirit of the commandments. Um, obe like oh, your heart is is the obedience, right? The spirit of the law, the spirit of the commandments is that your heart will do whatever God says. The basic instructions are like, don't don't murder, cheat, don't steal, don't covet. You know, um, take care of other people, like do to others as you have done to you. You know, it's it's very, it's the fruit, right? It's the fruit. Um, the one I just read, which one? Don't oppress your neighbor, rob him. The wages of a hired servant are not to remain with you until the morning. I don't know. Sometimes I don't understand. Like if I had a one-on-one -on -one with you, I'd be able to go through it. When someone asks you how they know they have the Holy Spirit, how would you answer that? 
um, like I don't I don't know like if if they have the Holy Spirit then they're not going to tell you something that's in the Bible or something that's that's not in the Bible as if it's not there you have to be really careful with that that's why you if you have the Holy Spirit then you'll discern what's truth through the scriptures and then you'll know what's true and what's a lie um, I forget where I was okay that's why I usually don't look at the comments for that reason um because I get sidetracked and I have ADD. <laughs> um, you're not to curse a deaf, the, the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. I am Adonai. Um, oh, okay. So as far as you don't have workers, I'm using that as an example for my life, right? Um, if you're, if you are a, uh, have hired servants, like this is literal, but even in my work, I have people that work for me. So I will make sure that they're paid before I get paid. Like I don't, I don't get paid before them sort of thing. There's companies that are like that. They're disgusting. Um, okay. Don't put a curse on the deaf nor a stomach block for the, but now stumbling blocks are huge because you can create a stumbling block because you're a hip, you could be a hypocrite. You could be doing things. Hold on. I think my, uh, okay. I think I'm back. Um, workers worth is higher passage. Yep. Yep. That's, uh, I think that's in Matthew 22. Um, so putting stumbling blocks, like blind and deaf are, are there are people that are unbelievers, but they could be a lost sheep. They could be a lost sheep from the house of Israel that just hasn't heard the truth because they've been ingrained within the system of, of the church or they've just left the, the faith because they're like, they, they feel it's hypocr hypocritical and they've been lied to. So don't put the stumbling blocks, don't put the Christmas tree in front of them. You know, don't don't put Halloween in front of them because that's going to be a stumbling block. If you have um, sins that you will not confess, let's say you're um, you're let's say you're a drinker, for instance, right? There's nothing in the Bible prohibits drinking, but it prohibits you from getting drunk. So if someone has a problem with drinking, and you're drinking, you're less likely to try to help them get out of it. So you might be a stumbling block to them because you have something that you haven't overcome. So how are you going to overcome them? Okay, uh, let's continue. Do not do injustice in judgment. You are not to be partial towards the poor, nor show favoritism towards the great, but you are to judge your neighbor in fairness. Now, this is a universal um, blessing, I believe, that God gives us right here in the book of Leviticus. Um, when I grew up, I grew up in a family um, that was poor, right? We didn't have a lot of things like today. But I realized I was rich. Why was I rich? Because I had a lot of love and my family, they weren't religious, but definitely morally right in terms of growing up in a Christian home. Um, we didn't talk about God. We didn't talk about the Messiah. We just, you know, love was the, the foundation of our home. So my father was in business and he had a, a restaurant. He took me to work when I was 10 and he said, son, I don't care if a bum on the street comes in here or the president of the United States comes in here, they get exactly the same service, okay? So I learned that through my dad. I learned Torah from my dad, who was not a Torah keeper, but he certainly understood not showing deference to the poor or favoritism to the rich, because that's what people do these days. You look good, you wear nice clothes, everyone's like, oh, that guy's great, or that, oh, look at that lady. It, it, they have a soul just like the person who's in the street, who's suffering. In fact, Yeshua was saying, take care of those people. And the reason we have those that, that going on is because we didn't obey this. We, we're not holy, okay? Um, right, no respect to persons, right? It's um, it's like the, the pro, not the prodigal, the, um, the Samaritan who took care of the, who took care of the Samaritan uh, or the man that was dying was the Samaritan who was considered um, out of covenant, right? Took care of the per person on the side of the road, right? So, um, and the religious people pass by. It's, you're not supposed to show partiality, okay? Um, especially in judgment. So you judge righteously. If a brother's in sin, I don't care if he's your best friend, you, you, you call it out. You go to him privately and you tell him, look, you're, you're in sin. You rebuke them because that's showing love. And we're gonna talk about that in a second too. Um, but that, that is right. That's the right way to handle a situation. If you're on the side of what's true and righteous, then you should never have a problem going to somebody who's in sin. Okay. Um, verse 16. Now this one, 
a little tougher, right? You see this happen a lot. You are not to go up and down as a tail bearer among your people. You are not to endanger the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. So the same times pe same time people are saying you you're not to rebuke um or you're you're supposed to rebuke frankly your neighbor in the next verses, right? But they they're tail bearers. They're telling stories about people without witnesses and they're slandering and they're gossiping and that's forbidden in the scriptures. You're not supposed to do that and it says it right here. Not just in Proverbs 6:16 6, through 19, but right here. Um Verse 17, you are not to hate your brother in your heart. This is forbidden throughout the whole, uh, the, the everything in the scriptures. In the New Testament, very much in the book of 1 John, if you hate your brother, and the Messiah says, if you have an issue with a brother and you don't correct it, or at least you do your part, don't even come and, and offer a sacrifice to me. Forgiveness, the lack of forgiveness, you know, hating your brother in your heart, it's a very, very grievous sin. God hates it, and it says it right there. But he says, don't hate your brother in your heart. Instead, rather, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor. Okay? So if you rebuke your, your brother and your neighbor, it's because you love them, you don't hate them. And there's a fine line. Why? Because motivation matters. The motivation of your heart, it, it matters to God. And then it says, um, rebuke your neighbor firmly and not bear sin because of him. So if you don't rebuke your neighbor, you don't love him, and you're not show, you're showing uh, partiality. It's not good. But he says, you are not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, many people have twisted that verse into, well, we just love people. Well, what is love? You have to define, to find uh, love according to scripture. So, you know, James talks about this, but the the message here is really what does Peter mean when he says to be holy? He's talking about Leviticus 19. This is my view of it. This is what I believe the Holy Spirit showed me. Am I telling you, you have to believe what I say? No, that's why I'm reading the scriptures. You figure it out. And if you learn something, then you show it. You show me what, what it says. Help me understand it because nobody has it all figured out. Nobody. If anybody thinks that they understand perfectly what Scripture says, they're lying to you because the Scripture says that we see through a glass dimly, we see in part. When we see him, we'll see in full. He hasn't come back yet. So we, we just know a little bit. And once you realize how little you know in Scripture, it frees you because then you're like, okay, I have to do these things first before I worry about all these other things that I don't know about yet. But at the same time, Share these things with your brother. That's why I'm trying to do this, is to share this with my brothers and sisters. I love you too, sister, and your family. Um, I'm trying to help people see that if you read the scriptures, God will speak to you because the scriptures are his word, and you can't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, and it is written. That's why when Peter, when, um, Peter says, it is written, it is written, be holy for I am holy. He's quoting the, the Torah, okay? He's quoting the Torah. So, I'll stop there, but you can keep reading that. But if you go back to 1 Peter, after he says, You are to be holy, for I am holy. It says, If you call on him as father, the one who judges impartially, there it is, according to each one's deeds, then live out the time of sojourning in reverent fear. You and I are just passing through in this life. Once you get to that place, and you fear God more than you fear man, the consequences of what's happening in your government, it's like you're free. Your ego's dead. It's no longer alive. That's what being crucified with the Christ is. It's your proud ego is dead. And now you don't live a life for self, self-indulgence, self-will. But here's the problem. We all have a meat suit. We all have flesh. And we got to fight the flesh. We have to contend for the faith. We have to brace our minds for action and keep our balance. Okay? Keeping our balance. Here's the last things I'm going to say because I'm not here to beat anybody up. I'm here to help build up the saints and prepare them. So sometimes I say things that seem harsh. I'm not trying to do that. Yes, the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. But this is the thing. You don't want to lose your intimacy that you once had with God because now you know Torah and now you're like, I'm walking in Torah and now I got to beat everybody up. Fine. 
Make sure you're ready in season and out of season to share, to share the truth with people. Messiah, who is he? Is he just some guy who plays a guitar and makes movies, the chosen movies and stuff like that or whatever? Like, I mean, I'm not going to bash that whole thing because I guess there's people who are hearing it and then they move on and that's good. But what happens is we lose something that, that Yeshua warns us of in Revelation chapter 2. He says um, to the church in Ephesus, the angel of the church in Ephesus writes, Thus th says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and the one who walks in the midst of the seven gold menorahs, lampstands, I know all your deeds and your toil and your patient endurance. These are good things. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. The fear of God is the hate evil. I'm down with that. He's right. He's like, good doing good you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and you have found them to be liars there's going to be people who seem like they are apostles but they're not why because they're liars what is a liar someone who's tail bearing bearing false witness like they don't enter the kingdom and there's going to be people who we thought were absolutely saved who are not going to be in the kingdom and there's people who are going to be like how the heck are they there you got to figure out where you're going to be before you worry about other people. Don't obey man. Obey God. I don't care if I taught you a hundred things from Scripture, right? I have the same. I got to follow this too, and I don't want to fall. I don't want you to fall, but we need to stay in these words so that we don't find ourselves on the other end of these. Which, if you're not testing them against your own heart instead of thinking about other people, you're in big trouble. But he says this. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 3, you have perseverance and you have endured for my name's sake. Now you have to know his name, okay? And you have not grown weary. You're strong. It sounds like this is a perfect church, right? These people are patient, endurance, they hate evil. But he says, I have this against you, that you have forsaken your first love. Man. That's a, that's a rough thing for God to say to you. And I hate to think that it's me, but sometimes I, I think this this is why I got to go back to these words. He says, remember then from where you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand, your menorah from its place, unless you repent. See, that's, he's saying repent. Repentance is the, the grace of God. It's the gift of God. It's Messiah's message. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. It says, Remember from where you fell. Remember. So, here's the good news. Because everyone's so focused on people falling these days and losing their crowns. You should, you should learn this. All scriptures God breathed, right? At least that's what I believe from 2 Timothy verse, or chapter 3, verse 16. But I read this verse in Proverbs 24, 16. It says, or 15, let's start with 15. Do not, lurk, don't, do not lurk like the wicked near the dwelling of the righteous. Do not assault his home. For though the righteous one may fall seven times, he gets back up. It says he rises up. But the wicked stumble in adversity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls or let your heart be glad when he stumbles. See? People are, you know, somebody died recently that was absolutely an enemy of my house. Absolutely, positively an enemy of my house. Just died two days ago. I saw the article. This is someone who was newsworthy. And I went, hmm, Lord, I, I pray that he was right with you before he died. Lord, I, I pray that, um, you know, he repented and that he's in your care. I did because I know this, you know, I don't rejoice because here's the thing. If you don't extend mercy to other people after God's extended mercy to you and he's not repaid us for the sins that, as we deserve, then he's not going to have mercy on you. Our heart has to be mercy, shalom and peace, mercy, not false grace, not false peace and security, the true covenant relationship that's the peace of God. Shalom means covenant relationship with God, according to scripture. So if you've fallen, then get back up. 
I don't care if it was this morning, yesterday, or tomorrow. Get back up. Get back into the scriptures. Start asking God to teach you from his word what it means to be holy and set apart because the Messiah prayed for us. John 17, 17. Father, he says, set them apart. Make them holy by the means of your truth. Your word is truth. So he prayed for us to be holy, Kedoshim, saints, set apart ones, right? Destined for a, an eternal kingdom that is forever. It's eternal. I want to be there. I want you to be there too. So the message is repent. It's always repent. There's never a message I don't think I've given that I'm like, repent. Kingdom is at hand. Repent. And you know what? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us. We're a body. We're the body. We're the one body. You know, if everyone wants to be the leader and tell everybody what to do. I, I want to do it what Yeshua did and let his people um, know the truth so that they can be free and follow him. He's your rabbi. Here's what it says in 1 John 1, eight. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, huge. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Not some of the unrighteousness, all of it. How, how beautiful is that? I hope you said hallelujah in your heart. When, you, when I read that, because, you know, none of us is deserving of this. No way. I don't care how obedient you are. Don't lose your love and your connection to God. Make sure you're praying and staying alert and awake, discerning what's going on. Don't let the wickedness of the world make you bitter or your heart wax cold. Because lawlessness is increasing. Um, blah, what, what happened? Oh, the uh, one thing I want to sh share with you. The elections, you know, everyone was worried that the Republicans weren't going to win enough seats to get control of the Senate, right? Because most normal believers, right, love are conservative in terms of their values, right? They don't want people, they, they don't like abortion. You know, they don't, they don't want um, people coming in from other countries and, and taking the benefits. All, it, the things that just make common sense, most people would say, well, I have to vote Republican. But once you extricate yourself from politics, you realize that it's all deception. And I'm going to say this to you because something happened yesterday. Um, what was it? Uh, it's the, the Republicans, they're not going to win the Senate, but it, the people are upset about it. And they're saying there's fake elections and there's, um, what are they saying? There's uh, the election fraud and all that stuff. Forget about that. It's a waste of time. It, you're going to miss what God has for you to do or the suffering that God has for you to do, you know, to, to do his will. So why does it not matter? point blank they are incorporated this marriage act i don't even know what it says i have no idea what it says but it says that 62 senators voted for equality in marriage meaning meaning this doesn't matter leviticus 18 21 oh, 22 you are not to lie with a man as a as with a woman it's an abomination like Leviticus 20, verse 13, all right? Like, like this is God's laws. If a man lies with a man as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be on them. So if this isn't true because you, it doesn't make you feel good, then just give up the whole thing. I'm not trying to encourage you to give it up. I'm saying that should convict you that you thought that 50 senators being Republican or 51 senators being Republican would stop something that God calls abominable from being passed in the land. Do you not see that maybe some of them are in there, have good good intentions, but it's not how they start, it's how they finish. And I don't know any politician that I trust that's finished their race, if you will. Not one. Not one. So if Yeshua sits at the right hand of God, which it says here, and he's interceding for us, you know, give your life back to him again. Get back up and start following him again. You know, the saints are not perfect. The saints fall, but the saints get up again. So keep getting up. Don't give up. Contend for the the faith. Um, brace your minds for action. All these things are in the scriptures for us to make sure that our minds are being transformed, not into this world, but into the perfect will of God. According to Romans 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, which says to have a sober estimate of yourselves. All right, 
I'm done. God bless you. In Yeshua's name, I pray. Have a great night. Amen.